good evening everyone uh, first of all i would like to give me few minutes i'll just introduce you okay <laughs> <laughs> okay good evening everyone dr shashank shikhar hari riyasi is a distinguished alumni of uh, mit institute of nanotechnology he is presently working as a post doctoral fellow at university of leeds dr shashank completed his phd in 2018 from gres university of technology austria on the topic simulated materials and interfaces he has extensive experience with ab initio simulation of molecules and interfaces and comparing the results with experiments he was associated with aint from 2009 to 2014 as a student of btech plus mtech he was awarded with balji shastri award for human and traditional values with this introduction i would request dr harivyasi to continue with his talk thank you dr shishan uh good evening everyone good evening uh, sina sir uh, richa ma'am and all the distinguished faculty uh, i recognize a lot of uh, names and i'm just glad to see every uh, see everyone in chat uh, and be back in my ant family uh, i will begin with my presentation and i will i will yes, uh, i'll start uh, immediately and then we can uh, discuss about my career and other things uh with time uh with uh, time uh, later on so <laughs> as everyone as mam said and as everyone knows i started with uh, uh yeah i i hope everyone can see my screen yes sir yeah okay uh so i started at ait and i graduated um, from with btech and mtech in 2014 uh for my master's thesis already i was in tu graz in austria and i continued over there with my phd and now i am at university of leeds in the uk and doing a postdoc over here uh Uh, unlike most of other graduates uh, in my batch i opted to go for simulations uh, with help uh, Uh, at every stage from uh, my faculty at AINT, and uh, uh, for doing simulations, uh, it's a it's quite a different career path. But the good part of it is that, uh, as in uh, as in present scenario, you can always work from home. Anyway, uh, I'll start with uh, some basic definitions, and I will uh, move on to. or why simulations are important um, uh, as a backup for experiments and uh, why both of them have to go hand in hand now uh, my specialization is mainly in surface sciences and simulation simulating surfaces and when it comes to surfaces the phenomena that i study particularly is adsorption now adsorption if you think of it is basically an increase in concentration of a sub substance at the interface that is the boundary between two phases and and uh, so basically you have a substance and the substrate and then you have an interface in between and it is at this interface that all the interesting physics and chemistry happens and this hap uh, this interactions happens due to surface forces so all i want to, uh, you to take away from the slide is basically that we i will be talking about interface most of the time and that i will be focusing on surface forces uh throughout my presentation for most uh, uh for most of for part of it now why is uh, why are these interfaces important i think uh, for anything to do with organic electronics uh where you have organic molecules on surfaces you can easily go into organic electronics and justify that uh, your work uh is ultimately aimed at improving device characteristics like performance efficiency and lifetime so you would not have bendable screens like samsung is having these days uh unless you have organic electronics because you can simply not fold inorganic silicon substrates so you have to have organic electronics uh, oled as uh, as it said uh, organic led light emitting diodes then in these devices or the thing that is of ultimate import importance is the interface because between every main component the drain and the source of the transistor the dielectric and the gate what you have is an interface 
you have a semiconductor dielectric interface that's the usual interface that you have but you also have the electrode semiconductor interface which is in organic electronics basically replaced by a metal organic molecule interface so you have um you have a metal on one side and you have the organic molecule on another side and this interface is what uh, determines the device's properties uh, its efficiency and like time and Therefore, it is of ultimate importance that we study this interface in complete detail and understand all its properties. Now, the properties, uh, so to say, emerge from the order of molecules on the interface. So if you have molecules, say, in this upright standing fashion, or you have molecules in this flat line fashion, this makes a major difference in how the electronics are, uh, how the electronics and the interface are. Also, the alignment of energy levels. So if you have, uh, simply put, the molecular orbital, the highest molecular orbital on one side, uh, the highest occupied molecular orbital on one side, and the Fermi level, so uh, the, uh, the Fermi level of uh, the electrode on another side, how exactly they are aligned, what is up, what is down, this makes a big difference in your ultimate efficiency of the device. Uh, Coming back to the point, you cannot uh, you cannot really determine these properties and make changes to them, make your device more efficient, uh, make it more um, more resilient, unless you basically study it. And to that, you have to have simulations and experiments. Now, I will be focusing on um, uh, on very limited scope of these uh, simulation experiments, I will be focusing mainly on quantum mechanical simulations, uh, which is my area of expertise, and uh, focusing only on microscopy experiments and photospectroscopy uh, uh, experiments. It's a vast field. There are a lot more uh, simulation methods as well as a lot, uh, a very, very large area of experimental techniques. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the third year students would already be familiar with that. Uh, uh, but you have to narrow down your scope when you are doing a PhD. And uh, I basically chose to uh, focus on these areas. Even in these areas, for quantum mechanical simulations, and I promise you this is the only slide I have about this thing, uh, I, I use density functional theory. And density functional theory is a very, uh, it's, it, uh, it has a very deep mathematical foundation but simply and in very, very simple terms, what, is, what it does is it replaces the interaction between every single electron. Uh, so if you have an atom or an ion and it's surrounded by electrons, each electron will feel another electron and it will also feel the ion. And it, if you imagine, uh, you can always calculate what is the elect what's the disturbance felt by an electron because of the presence of another electron. But as soon as you go into three body systems where, where you have to compute the interaction between three electrons, it already becomes difficult and you, cannot, uh, you can no longer solve it, at least on paper. And now imagine uh, simulating a substance, say even a molecule, which is having at least hundreds of electrons uh, in many cases, especially organic molecules with, uh, which are large having a, uh, uh, carbon backbones and polymers. And uh, it's simply not possible to compute electrons, uh, uh, the interaction of every single electron with another, uh, even if you have all the computing time in the universe, even if you put all the uh, computer in the universe, you cannot calculate it exactly for a large polymer. So you, you, uh, you make an assumption. The assumption is that you even out uh, all the electrons and consider it as a single material with, an, with a density, let's say. And this is the density of electrons in the system. And then what you do is you calculate the effect of this density on every single electron. So now you have reduced your interaction, your many body interaction where each electron is interacting with another with basically uh, a potential which is felt in the background by a single electron. And then you can comp uh, you, then you can calculate the property of a single electron, uh, electron by electron, one by one, and come come out with a uh, with an answer. And fortunately for us, uh, this comes out to be very very uh, accurate. Uh, so 
accurate enough for us to compare simulations and experiments. Unfortunately enough, not so accurate that uh, you can trust uh, experiments, uh, simulations blindly. So uh, my point over here is the simulations and experiments do have to go hand in hand and both of them support each other as I will make, uh, as I will elaborate uh, in the coming slides. Now, <clears throat> Uh, now, one thing you have to remember, uh, which I will come back to later, is when you are simulating this electron density, even then you cannot, uh, you cannot consider the system to be infinitely extended. And you have to end calculating your system at some point. And this is why you just draw simply a radius around your, uh, your atom and say, okay, I will calculate only within this area. And the, only the electrons within this area will be considered when I am doing my simulation. And anything beyond that, uh, I will have to make use of crude methods. I cannot calculate the electron-electron uh, interactions very, very far away from uh, the atom. And therefore, DFT, uh, as I treat it, or as most of the people who, in, uh, who are in this field treat it, is considered semi-local. So it's not exactly local. It does extend to some uh, some uh, degree, but it does not extend infinitely, and it does not uh, extend, say, beyond three or four angstroms behind uh, beyond the uh, electron uh, beyond the atom you are treating. Now, uh, so coming back to my uh, presentation. Uh, I will be do, uh, I will be talking about quantum mechanical simulations DFT and throughout the slide uh, throughout the presentation I will be using the method it's simply a method called PBE I will not go into details we can discuss in the uh, time but uh, the the discussion I just had about semi-local uh, methods considered PBE and the cruder methods uh, to treat interactions further beyond are what is considered as Van der Waals interactions because they are actually what uh, we study as Van der Waals interactions that happen at a distance between any two given substances. For microscopy, I will be uh, focusing on scanning tunneling microscopy and for, photo, uh, for photo spectroscopy, I will be uh, focusing only on UPS, that is ultra photo uh, ultraviolet photoelectron uh, spectroscopy. I will discuss them as they come up, so don't worry. Uh, the first system I will consider is a non-planar molecule on copper 111 surface. And the second system, if time permits, will be upstanding silver symbol monolayer on gold 111, uh, which I will be discussing in context of next FS, but I doubt we will have time for that. <laughs> so why this particular molecule, the subthalocyanin on 111 uh, 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 copper surface? The, Subthalocyanin, when I say subthalocyanin, there's only one variety of subthalocyanin that is there, and that is the chloroboron subthalocyanin with uh, a structure like this, boron in the center and chlorine attached to it. And over here, it looks simple, but in, in reality, so to say, the shape of the molecule is quite different. And it's actually a non-planar molecule, which makes the geometry very interesting. So the gas phase geometry of this molecule becomes interesting. Uh, as you can see over here. So it's no, it's no longer planar, and, uh, which gives it very interesting properties, uh, especially uh, optoelectronic properties. Uh, in the community, it is simply called shuttlecock-shaped molecule because of such a peculiar shape. It's one of the very few mo molecules with, uh, with such a shape. Uh, and by that, I mean it has got a threefold vertical symmetry, and the electrons uh, the electronic conjugation runs over the entire molecular backbone. <clears throat> now, when you put it on copper 111, you would expect something interesting because the molecule itself is threefold symmetric and copper 111 has uh, sixfold symmetry. So, uh, our co experimental colleagues in America were uh, basically interested in molecule and before I even arrived for my PhD, they had thrown some of these molecules on a copper 11 surface and tried to study it using UPS. And this is where uh, the entire, uh, this is what gave direction to my thesis because the results were not exactly clear. And I was tasked with uh, uh, explaining them their experimental results using theory. So what did I do? I basically did the same thing. I threw some of these molecules 
on copper 111 in silico, so in simulations, and studied the substrate. Now, when you throw it on the surface, you can expect the molecule to land in two different manners. Either it can uh, land in this way, where the chlorine atom is pointing upwards, or it can land in this way, where the chlorine atom is pointing downwards. And when they studied it, uh, so when the colleagues in uh, America, they studied it, uh, they came out with this particular picture where they study it in STM and um, bingo, you have two, uh, two species and only do uh, these two species that occur on the surface. And when you see the entire surface, you only find these two. And they were happy. They, they suggested that, okay, uh, this one, because this is greater height, you see a red blob in the, sand, the center. This one has to be this uh, with, the uh, with the chlorine atom going up. And this one with, where you do not see anything, anything bright in the center, this has to be this because you have uh, what seems like a depression in the center. But if anyone with careful eye will notice this is not actually a depression because it's still higher than the blue parts. So there is something going on over here and this was not uh, very clear. Now, when I was tasked with uh, studying this, I simulated, it, uh, simulated this and these are actually results from my master's thesis, which then formed part of my, uh, uh, part of my, and I presented that at uh, AINT, which later formed part of my PhD thesis, and I published papers uh, on it. Uh, these two figures, and over here you clearly see that, fine, the uh, blob of chlorine up, that's, that holds, you have a very strong adsorption uh, energy of around 3.5 electron volts, which is very good. Uh, anything about three means a very strong bond with the surface. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at what was supposed to be the other uh, other uh, structure, that doesn't really hold its uh, ground, quite literally. It, it doesn't seem that it will stand up uh, with such a low uh, adsorption energy. Uh, it, it actually, it, it at room temperature or even at 77 degrees Kelvin where they studied, you should not be able to see this. The structure should be rotating at a very high speed because of thermal excitations. So this was not uh, possible as far as simulations were concerned, so, uh, giving us a very clear idea that something else is happening. And what, what is the something else that can happen? Now, all you can imagine is you simply let the molecule fall further down. Uh, this, however, does not reproduce experimental results. You see a very big blob, which is nowhere to be seen in uh, experiments. So what else can be going on? Uh, that I came up with the idea and uh, this uh, idea or this, um, yeah, this idea was basically the, uh, the thing that finished this project. And the idea was, what if this chlorine atom is actually getting disassociated uh, from the molecule? And you have what is called dechlorination uh, because of the surface. Now, if I simulated, uh, or when I simulated this dechlorinated structure, I see that uh, as soon as the chlorine is removed, I see something similar uh, to experiments, but still the outside ring is higher than the inner ring, uh, the inner part of the molecule. And therefore we came up with uh, the next step, which says that the molecule actually inverts itself after getting adsorbed. And you see uh, uh, you, you, the inner part of the molecule pops back up forming this particular structure. Uh, so, with this in silico adsorption of the two um, two cases, if the molecule lands in this particular um, orientation, what you have is your chlorine first of all moves away, and then your molecule tries to readjust itself because of its strong interaction with the surface. The backbone uh, gets attracted towards the surface, and the inner part of the molecule pops back up giving it this very peculiar height in the center and uh, low features in the, in the periphery. Uh, and now if we, um, if we simulate this particular uh, structure and compare it with experiments, it becomes, it, it, it is very, very, very similar to the experiments. And we can confidently say that the second species that they ha had was not the molecule standing upside down, but actually the dechlorinated uh, molecule and the first one was what they thought so that was always clear from the beginning uh, in short uh, 
we were able to conclude that declonation of this particular molecule happens on the surface only be, uh, with help of theory. And this was not uh, immediately clear in experiments at all. However, there's more to the story. And uh, <clears throat> now I move to the portion where theory um, becomes a major part of the story. The adsorption height of this molecule uh, was very low. So it is 2.2 angstroms uh, on copper 111. And when it is compared to other systems of the same uh, same family, the thalocyanins, the larger family uh, to which the subthalocyanin molecule belongs, none of them actually come down to this closer height on copper 111. However, it is very similar to other planar and completely plain molecules. The PTCDA on copper, oh sorry, uh, pentacene quinone on copper 111 and pentacene on copper 110. They have an absorption height which is quite similar. Uh, and there is a, like, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to an untrained eye, this seems quite similar, but this makes a lot of difference when it comes to device properties because one is uh, strongly adsorbed to the surface and another is not quite so strongly adsorbed. So you see two completely different uh, electronic structures when you uh, when you look at the system so why is this particular molecule when adsorbed in this particular orientation getting planarized uh, is it a common feature does this always happen and the answer is actually no it does not uh, always happen in this case we have a planarization where this molecule is going from 116 degrees to uh, so what is almost uh, 103 degrees. So you have a change of uh, 13 degrees in its uh, in the angle it forms. However, another non planar molecule, uh, coranulene, which is basically a cut a cut portion from a buckyball, the C60 molecule, that never planarizes. So it is on copper one one one. So it is not true that every non-planar molecule would planarize on copper. Sorry. Uh, and this itself is an interesting question. Why is this, this particular molecule planarizes where others do not? Uh, the adsorption height as well, for this one is 2.23. Uh, the average height for coanulene is three. The minimum is 2.2, yes. But the average height for all the copper, uh, all, all the carbon atoms is three angstroms. So question, why? Uh, now to do that, I'll take you through uh, basically uh, third semester physics where you study the, uh, where you study the interaction between two, two uh, atoms or two materials uh, when they come in close contact with each other. So over here, I research for a xenon monolayer or xenon atom simply adsorbing on copper 111. And as you see, at far away distances, uh, as, you, as you bring xenon close to the surface, the energy of the system keeps on decreasing. And there is a certain optimum point where the energy of the system is minimal. And if you try and push your copper at, uh, if, if you try and push your xenon atom even further into the surface, the energy starts increasing. And this is basically, you have a system where uh, electrons first of all, start interacting with each other. And at a the point, they start repelling each other and uh, there's, a, uh, there's this increase in energy. So you have uh, the dominance of Van der Waals interaction, the attractive part, and then you have the dominance of the repulsive part where electrons will start repelling each other. And I have over here the same curve for my molecule. And I, uh, Keen, I would immediately spot a difference that my curve is actually almost planar. You can uh, you can fit it to a plane line, uh, and it fits very very well with uh, with a plane line. And this should not uh, this is not a regular feature of adsorption. A regular adsorption curve looks like that. Uh, you come down slowly, and then you go up, uh, uh, and then you go up abruptly. You do not come down in a plane uh, in a planar fashion, uh, or in a straight line. So. Again, uh, something unusual. Uh, now, coming to the point where you can make use of theory, 
the benefit of doing theory is you can turn on and off things at will. And this is something you cannot do in experiments. So you can actually turn on physics at will. You can, you can say, okay, I will not treat this particular portion of physics and see how that makes a difference to my calculations. And this gives you a control system where you have, uh, where, where you have a physics, physical phenomena and where you do not have a physical phenomena. And you can therefore determine what is the effect of a particular physical phenomena uh, using theory. This is not always possible in, uh, in experiments. You cannot have a, a, a system where you decide, okay, I will turn off my Van der Waals interactions. Nature will not allow you to do that. But in computers, uh, in theory, you can do that. And though it sounds funny, because I can do stuff which is not allowed in nature, what it actually does, it helps me uh, pluck out things uh, in a complicated system and uh, explain to my, my, simula uh, my experimental colleagues, okay, this is why this is happening. In your experiment, you see all these features, but these features are actually a result of this, this, and this physical phenomena, because I can plug them part by part. It's like uh, it's actually like uh, differentiation by parts. You can put it uh, uh, apart and you can solve your mystery. Now, over here, what I've done is I've removed the Van der Waals interaction. So I've removed all this uh, attractive interaction and see what happens to my system. Here is the result. Actually, my molecule refuses to get adsorbed at all. So you will see that the adsorption energy of this particular system where I have removed the Van der Waals uh, interaction, you do not have any uh, any uh, point in the data where the adsorption energy is less than zero. And this simply means that the molecule will not get adsorbed on the surface. Now, this is uh, interesting in itself because at one hand you have weak or supposedly weak Van der Waals attract interaction bringing the molecule to the surface. But if I just turn off these weak interactions, I do not get this uh, uh, adsorption to the surface at all. Where in principle, in most cases, or uh, even if you get rid of these Van der Waals interactions, you should at least see the molecule is still getting stuck because of the chemical reactivity of the molecule with the surface. So there is something very complicated happening over here where only by turning off a physical phenomena, we are turning some part of chemistry uh, from the system and my uh, my uh, major portion of my thesis was exploring why this is happening in theory because only in theory you can turn off physics chemistry at will how what i did was i have these van der waals interactions they are they are treated simply as uh, <clears throat> r is to the power six and a coefficient c and th this gives you an additive term that you add to uh, every single interaction between every single pair of atoms, like uh, atom A, atom B, you uh, add it, and you add it throughout all the atoms in your system, and you have a uh, Van der Waals energy term, which is always positive. What I did was scale this. I scaled this uh, using a parameter called, uh, which I named S, uh, scaling parameter, and I turned it off from zero to one. So I'm, I'm slowly and steadily increasing the, the amount of Van der Waals interactions in my system and trying to pluck out what, what physics and chemistry is happening because of these, this solely physical phenomena. So I'll uh, note over here again, Van der Waals interactions, this is solely physical phenomena in, uh, in surface science community. Uh, and no one actually expects chemical phenomena happening because of Van der Waals interactions because simply they are so weak. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other word for Van der Waals interactions are uh, non-covalent interactions, which itself uh, uh, is trying to distinguish it from covalent interactions or chemical interactions in general. Now, uh -huh, theory, I can do whatever I want. When I scale, I see uh, something interesting, and that is that the adsorption height actually goes down in stages. So when I increase my, uh, my Van der Waals interactions from zero to one at around 40%, my molecule is already adsorbed. It's adsorbed at a height of three angstroms. And only when I increase it even further and I go all the way to 100%, do I see the complete adsorption like I have shown you previously. So, it is not a, it is not a, a linear curve. 
it is a stage staged curve you have uh, the molecule not adsorbed then you have the molecule adsorbed at three angstroms approximately and then you have the molecule adsorbed as it is adsorbed on the surface and this is uh, uh, this is something you would not expect if you were to increase it from zero to one and it was a physical phenomena where it goes smoothly from zero to one now <clears throat> this uh, change in adsorption height and this staged phenomena is also seen in the planarity of the molecule. So how planar this molecule is, as you see, it's very non-planar. Over here, it is planar, more or less, or at least the carbon backbone is planar. And I can also trace the planarity with increasing the scaling factor, where I see, okay, not planar, somewhat planar, very planar. And uh, this very planar gives me the adsorption height of 2.3, which is same as the planar molecules I mentioned earlier. So this molecule actually changes from non-planar to planar and it gets adsorbed at 2.3. Now, I can also study the electronic structure uh, of this entire system. And what I see is that when it goes from completely non-planar to somewhat uh, non-planar, I see a shift in the energy levels of my uh, molecule. It uh, basically brings down the energy uh, energy levels of the molecule, the LUMO or the molecule, and it dec it uh, decreases energy and it comes at the same uh, point as where you have the Fermi level of the metal. So the molecule does interact with the metal, and you uh, you find what is uh, referred to as physics uh, option of the molecule at 0.4 or 40 percent of uh, Van der Waals interactions, and then if you go uh, if you if you go on uh, this uh, forty percent of interaction is very very similar to the interaction that you see uh, when your molecule is absorbed on silver. So silver is weakly interacting in comparison to copper, and on cop on silver you have this particular situation where the electrons in the system are weakly perturbed you have some electrons that move away from the uh, molecule and some electrons that accumulate on the molecule. And the entire region in between is basically untouched. You do not ch see any change in the electrons of the system. This is a weakly interacting system or what is called physics option. And, <clears throat> and you see, see the similar situation in uh, copper, uh, in subthalocyanin so copper 111 as well. If you have the scaling factor of 40%, uh, your molecule behaves as if it is uh, physisorbed. Also, the height of the molecule is similar. It is a three angstroms. This is a three angstroms. So the, the adsorption of molecule on copper 111, uh, 111 that is actually a staged process, which uh, starts with non-interacting to physisorption and then to the next step, which I come next, uh, to which I come next. The next step, in the next step, what happens is, the electronic structure of the molecule that actually gets lost. You do not see any clear features anymore. And this is because the molecule, uh, the orbitals of the molecule, as soon as it lands completely on the uh, copper 111 surface, they interact so strongly with the uh, copper 111 surface that the orbitals hybridize uh, with the surface. And this hybridization is actually very similar to the uh, hybridization that you um, that you study for molecular orbitals, where you see, uh, where, where you study about hybridization of uh, uh, one orbital with another. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, chemically and physically the same phenomena because you can see in this particular situation, what is happening is electrons are leaving, electrons are leaving the molecule, electrons are leaving the copper surface and they're accumulating in between. The red portion is the plus, uh, plus portion where you have an accumulation of electrons. So the electrons are ac accumulating in between. They are forming a, uh, the molecule is forming a bond with the uh, copper surface. And therefore this can simply be termed as a chemisorbed uh, molecule now, or chemisorption process. Now, over here, <clears throat> I can justify my results with help of experiments now, because uh, when you uh, when you compare these results with uh, experimental results, you see the same situation where the molecule 
when it is adsorbed on copper 111 you do not see any features so in the in this range uh the black curve do not show you any features all the features are uh, have been uh, have been uh, extinguished on the other hand if you put the same molecule on uh, highly uh, highly oriented uh, pyrolytic graphite which is simply a non interacting surface so uh, all i want to, you to know is the hob g is a non interacting surface and when you put this molecule on a non interacting surface you actually still see the features from this molecule so what is happening is uh, experimentally i can prove that the features are, are extinguished as soon as you put this molecule on copper and the reason for this is that the molecule is, interacts very strongly with the surface you do not see the same thing when you uh, when you put the molecule on a non interacting surface where it just simply fizzes off uh, fizzes off now why is this hybridization important because in uh, in real world this um, determines the registry of the molecule or how the molecule is exactly oriented on the surface completely uh, for example over here i have the molecule adsorbed on copper 111 you see it is uh, a, determined by all this uh, electrons electronic rearrangement the shape of the molecule on the surface uh, on the top layer of copper 111 is aligned in this particular manner on the other hand if you have copper 100 the molecule would absorb in this particular fashion where uh, there are very uh, uh, there are differences between this particular structure and this particular structure solely because the uh, the interaction between uh, between the carbon backbone and the copper 111 surface or, or copper 100 surface uh, is different in both these systems now <clears throat> returning to uh, the projected density of states that i showed you i showed you that the features first of all change or, or the, the electronic structure of the molecule shifts uh, when it fizzes off and then it completely extinguishes when it gets chemisorbed i can also so, uh, show you the stages in between that how this uh, phenomena exactly happens or the staged nature of this formula uh, of this uh, process where you do not uh you see that the electronic structure does not change so much changes uh at this particular in this particular region and then changes even further in this particular region so the electronic structure the change in electronic structure of the system is completely linked to the uh adsorption height of the system as well as the planarity of the molecule it is only when the molecule planarizes that you see this particular change in uh electronic structure and it is the planarization of the molecule which in turn allows the molecule to be to, to be hybridized completely because uh that that uh, current uh, coronal molecule cannot planarize it does not get hybridized either so these features are uh, these phenomena basically support each other in turn and allow this uh, for this very very uh, strange system with this peculiar adsorption uh, adsorption potential uh the take home message from over here and uh, the selling point of my paper was uh, uh, that i published on this particular uh, uh, research was that while vandervas interactions are considered to be weak forces they actually allow for planarization of the molecule and only because the planarization happens do we see this particular chemisorbed formula uh, for uh, chemisorbed formation if we do not uh, have these vandervas interactions the molecule will never planarize in the first place and then you will never have the chemis option so even though van der waals interactions are not supposed to interfere chemically in the system in this particular situation because of uh, the uh, because of the peculiar geometry of the molecule and the uh, reactive nature of copper substrate uh, you have all these features coming into play where van der waals interactions allow for a chemical or uh, yeah permit a chemical interaction to take place uh so main findings for the uh, for this particular uh, part was uh, surface is important and sur surface mediated reactions must be considered so uh, this was the uh, drawback of the experimental findings in the first part where they never considered that uh, okay surface uh, can mediate a deconvolution reaction 
Second, I found that the absorption of this particular molecule actually in, involves two interaction regimes, physics option, chemist option, which happens in a staged fashion. Uh, uh, hybridization, uh, as I've shown, you can uh, fundamentally alter the interfacial electronic structure and it, it uh, helps determine the adsorption geometry of uh, adsorption registry of the molecule on the surface. And uh, my contribution to the entire field, that is scaling C6 coefficients, uh, which was my idea, uh, can be a useful way of tracing the adsorption process in stages. And you can, uh, and you can, um, uh, yeah, you can, uh, 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 you can look into uh, the adsorption phenomena in a step-by-step -step process uh, using uh, this particular technique. So uh, now my take home is, uh, or the take home message that I want you guys to take from this is that experiment and simulations have to go hand in hand in hand. Uh, you cannot uh, do one without another. As I showed you, uh, experimental results were confusing on their own accord. And ultimately when I had my simulation results, I had to take the backing of uh, experiments to prove my point. Uh, with this, I have a, a small question to the organizers. Uh, should I continue to the next part, which will also take around half an hour, or should we stop over here and con continue with the question answer? Because the uh, uh, next part is unrelated, but also similar uh, similar uh, topic of showing how simulations and theory go hand in hand. Sasank, uh, due to the time constraint, I would suggest that you can uh, stop here. And we yeah. can take the, take the question because uh, we have the another scheduled meeting in the MS team. So where okay. our student will want to interact with you for another 10, 15 minutes. So if you have to show to something else, you can show within another five minutes. Otherwise, we can take the question and answer. Of the uh, okay, so I will, I will quickly skip to... Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll quickly shift to this particular slide where I'll show that there was this particular system where I, I was simply take away this. There was this theory result and this experimental results. And in this case, theory was unable to reproduce experiments. Experiments are almost in all cases true, unless uh, the experimentalist has some uh, machine problem or something. The results from experiments are considered to be the truth. And the, there, it is very well possible that theory won't fit experiments in all cases. And therefore, you have to take into account, uh, or the, the, the person who is doing theory has to take into account uh, all the possible situations and have to has to carefully pick the methodology to, uh, sorry, uh, to come up with the, uh, to come up with an explanation of why things are going wrong, wrong and uh, if you are able to do that successfully, as I was in this case, you can actually then turn, uh, you are actually then able to fit uh, simulation and experiments uh, well with each other. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a take home message. In this part, I would like to emphasize that in theory, you can always make mistakes and you have to be very, very careful with the, your methodology, uh, simply because in theory, if you put in garbage, you get garbage out. It is computers, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, that is a fall. Uh, even if you uh, if you go ahead and do research with, and uh, decide to become a, an experimentalist, please remember whenever you get results from your theory colleagues, uh, take that with a grain of salt and make sure that you go along with a good theorist. Uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, from my group in grass because the results I've shown you are mainly from my PhD thesis in grass. Uh, my collaborators with which I worked in Milan, uh, my collaborators in US, and now the present group in Leeds who are supporting me, uh, yeah, supporting with me in my new research interests, uh, exploring Van der Waals interactions even further. Thank you. So thank you, Sasan, for really, really giving an insight on how the, uh, um, the theoretical work is important for the experimental uh, explanation. And sometimes the theory explains the result, which is not otherwise explained by the, uh, the experimental, only with the experiments. So with this, uh, the session is open for the questions. We can put your questions. 
and to the ant student uh, there is another meeting just after this we have arranged in the ms team so they can join and have the more uh, informal interaction than the uh, the question and answer session so sasank will be with us in the ms team also just after this so you can put your questions and the first question which i can see is from navkant and navkant is uh, uh, is asking hello sir i am very much interested in dft simulation and i am currently performing one right now sadly i am on huge age to where to apply for a geo if i want to pursue dft uh, simulation as a career without doing a phd so can you help him yes uh, actually uh, if you want to do simulations and particular dft simulations uh, they are very useful uh, in also bio uh, uh, um, biochemistry field where you have uh, Uh, you simulate proteins and molecules. Uh, they, uh, commercially speaking, biotechnology firms do a lot of DFT simulations to simulate uh, medicines, proteins, and uh, uh, all these um, molecules. And uh, there, you will have a lot of opportunity in terms of uh, uh, a non non academic career. Y you can also, in, in terms of uh, uh the more traditional dft focusing on physics and chemistry you can also do that in uh, in uh, in industry the only thing is that companies the number of companies that do uh material simulations is a lot low uh, lot less in number compared to the number of companies that do simulations in biomolecules and medicines and proteins so yeah there all there are a number of companies which do simulations and uh, you simply have to uh, uh, pick up uh, pick up those companies and apply over there uh, for an internship i think uh, the aint formula of applying for an internship is the best formula <laughs> in hindsight because it it gives you a backdoor entry into uh, into research fields uh, where if you just simply apply for a job because of lack, lack of experience it's very very hard to get so basically the idea which we have started in 2002 uh, most of the uh, university and institution is following that and uh, if you can see the any university who is either private or the uh, even the government organization now they are also asking their student to take the six month dissertation in the last semester so our formula of 2002 unfortunately we have not patented it if you have patented it you will probably we are getting some <laughs> some uh, revenue for that so anyway <laughs> so that is there uh, there are a few questions uh, there is some uh, anomalous attendee who is asking for certificate you will get the certificate uh, once you close the this um, uh, this uh, zoom you will get a message that you have attended so that is the certificate separately we are not uh, providing any certificate and the i i did earlier also i have told you these are the sharing of the ppt to the attendee this is the copyrights or the this is the ipr of the uh, speaker so it all totally depend upon the speaker you can separately request the speaker if he if he want to share with you uh, we don't have any objection but for that you have to separately request for that it cannot be uh, shared uh, in a bulk uh, another question sasank we have with the chinmay sukla who is our student and he is asking sir i had a small project using dft in recent time i was i was not able to understand how to do number of energy band be identify for a molecule without going for some difficult math including just using quantum espresso uh well in most cases especially in quantum espresso because i have used it uh, you already have uh, tools provided by other people who, who would have done uh, what you you want to do so all you have to go is ask uh, the other people who have done the same thing and they mostly they will provide you with uh, the uh, computer program uh, the fortran python script or whatever to do the same thing and if not uh, well then uh, then you will have to do the difficult maths <laughs> i'm oh. sorry to say that mm -hmm. uh, like um, in like i have actually never come across a problem where i had to sit down and do difficult maths because everyone uh, all of my faculty can tell me i, I was not very good at maths <laughs> I was still uh, not very good at math, but uh, uh, in most cases, you can ask for help, and people are more than willing to help you. 
So Chin Mai, you can contact any of of the our physics faculty who is always have some or other way have the some experience with the simulation. So we can contact any one of that. You can contact uh, me. You can contact Sumanth. Uh, you can contact Robin. You can contact uh, um, Asis. Uh, all we, we are the person who has uh, keep uh, simulating the result. So that should not be issue. So you can contact any one of us. So we will be ready to help you. And especially the quantum experience. So Sumanth is a person who is working with the such kind of the simulation. So you just run behind him and try to catch him and get the maximum result out of uh, him. How much you can get it? So, uh, Sasanka, I am not taking further questions uh, because our student will be waiting in the MS team. So thank you all, and uh, uh, we'll see you in the next uh, webinar. Uh, thank you.